Okay, so what is this African American Brain Health Initiative? Well, it comes out of the issue that African Americans have twice the risk of Alzheimer's and age-related memory loss. And that really was what spurred us to ask, what could we at the university do to help our community here address that issue? And the reasons for this increased risk um, are probably not biological. They're environmental, lifestyle, and behavioral factors. So the good news is this risk can be brought down. And part of our mission has been to establish a community brain health advisory board. You met with some of the people. Diane introduced them to work with some of the community organizations, many of you here, and together to, to work within the community and the university to promote brain health, promote cognitive vitality, and to have a better understanding of brain and mental health disorders. And so that's why we're all here today, and that's why we're all working together. These are a few of our community partners. Um, I'm hoping all of you are represented here. This just shows the spread and, and the, the inclusiveness of uh, the, the very different organizations that surround Rutgers Newark that have been involved in this initiative. Okay. We've had now, this is our eighth year. We've been doing this for eight years. And over the last eight years, we've had aging and brain health programs for seniors. We've had lunch and learns at churches, dementia caregiver support days, very important because so many people here in the community are taking care of a loved one with Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, and thanks to Margaret Camareri and the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, we've been able to run these fabulous brain and heart healthy soul food cooking classes. So these are just some of the kinds of programs we've been doing over the last eight years. Um, you have all of you a, uh, in your uh, little handout, you've got a brochure, um, the Rutgers Newark African American Alzheimer's Awareness Program. Um, you can turn to that later, it tells you what is Alzheimer's disease, why are African Americans more at risk, when does it begin, how does it develop, and how is it diagnosed and treated. It's an overall resource guide to understand Alzheimer's. What's the future? We've gone, had eight years, and our goal is not just to continue in the same, but to grow. Um, and one of the things that we are very committed to doing is integrating this community engagement with the other missions of the university. So the university has a mission towards research, fundamental research, to advance our understanding of the world, including ourselves and our brains and our health. And Rutgers is uh, at the forefront of that. We want to integrate the African American Brain Health Initiative with research um, and with education. We have graduate students. We have undergraduates. You're going to meet one of our young stars here. And our goal is to get the students, both the undergraduates and the graduate students, involved in this. And this way, the program becomes more than just the community engagement, but it's something that links together the research, the education, the community engagement. Uh, their other goal is to bring in sustainable funding. We've been sort of hand to mouth with, with various corporate and other private donors to keep these programs going. Our goal now is to expand, by expanding to including research, we can target the National Institutes of Health and try to bring in substantial long-term sustainable funding. And my, my good friend Francis Dixon told me the other day, he says, we don't do any one shots. He says, he says, I'm not interested in anybody who's going to come here, do something, and then disappear. As he knows, we've been working with Francis and the rest of you for eight years, and our goal is to continue working. And part of that goal is to bring in some sustainable funding. And, and ultimately, what we hope is not only are we able to be impact the local community, but we're going to be able to make Rutgers Newark a nationally recognized center for innovative approaches to African American brain health issues. So this is really our, our launch this year to announce a, a new research program at Rutgers University Newark in Pathways to Healthy Aging in African Americans. And this research program is going to have two parts. The first is observational studies. We want to understand at each point in the age range, from young to old to older old, how do the various factors influence from biology, from who your par parents, from uh, behavior, from lifestyles, from diet to sleep. How do all these factors at each point in the life lifespan affect different aspects of learning and memory? Um, the second part of this program is interventional studies. And we have here Dr. Brandon Alderman, who uh, will come up a little bit later and talk. He's a world expert on exercise and, and exercise physiology and how that helps the brain and mood. And uh, with his collaboration with his students from Rutgers New Brunswick, we're planning, we're beginning some exercise and yoga classes. So it's not just enough to ask, what are the factors which make some people more likely to maintain brain health and the others not? But how can we take those people who we've identified as being at most at risk and what can we do to help them? How can we intervene, particularly with programs based on exercise and yoga and lifestyle changes? So that's really the launch this year after eight years of community outreach and education to begin to expand to include research. We have a brochure that's in your flyer that we, that we communicate. It's, it's about African Americans and the benefits of participating in research. 
and Elian, a student in my lab, will talk a bit more about this later. But this brochure and Elian later will talk about what are the benefits of research participation, why have African Americans been underrepresented, and what are the measures that are in place to ensure that everyone who participates is safe. This is another brochure that you'll find in your flyer. It's one that we're going to be distributing through all the churches and senior centers. It's our recruitment flyer. It tells you about the study. Why are we doing this study, brain health? What were you asked to do if you participate? How long does it take? And what are the benefits for any individual who participates? And this flyer has this information, and we'll talk more about it. We'd hope that all of you, I think we have how many people here today? 170? So we'd love to get all 170 of you enrolled in this study to participate. And this will help make us uh, a real research powerhouse to be able to not only to ask questions that are relevant to this community, but nationally as well. Um, there's a card. For those of you who would like to participate, there's a card in your, in your uh, uh, folder. Um, you can return this card, fill it out, and give it to any of the staff, any of Diane's staff or, or my staff here at this table or at the door or at the table. Fill that out and give it to them, and someone will contact you, or you can call or email. But one way or the other, we want to get everyone here and everyone in the community involved in this important research study. And we have a website many of you have been to. This tells you more about the programs and the research, and also has lots of advice on memory and brain health for you to go to. So that's a bit of an overview of, of where we've been for the last eight years, where we hope to go in the next decade. And uh, that now leads me to jump into trying to share with you a little bit of what comes out of the laboratories here that we think might be of interest to you. So I'm going to talk about memory, how does it work, why it sometimes doesn't, and what you can do starting now to improve yours. So the first question everybody asks me when they say, find out that I work in memory and Alzheimer's is, how do I know if I'm going to get Alzheimer's disease? How do I know if I already have the beginnings of it? Okay? And the answer is very simple. The answer is, you keep forgetting something, not once, but over and over. You've been told it over and over, and you keep forgetting it. So let me give you an example of something you've been told over and over again. Okay? You've been told that you should turn off your cell phones at the beginning of a movie or a lecture or an event like this. Okay? But invariably, there's going to be someone who shows up with early stage Alzheimer's, and their phone goes off in the middle of the talk. So as you know, we really want to build research programs. And part of research is recruiting people who have Alzheimer's. So if anyone's phone goes off during today's events, and I can't see who they are because it's far away, I'd like everyone to turn around and point to them and say, Alzheimer's. OK? <laughs> and that will either help us recruit for Alzheimer's or will scare them to always turning off their cell phone. So let me tell you a little bit about the science of memory. How does memory work? And to tell you about it, I introduced you a fellow named Henry Moleason, who was known for many years as HM. And he was known as HM to protect his privacy. And he had had a part of his brain called the hippocampus. And I'll talk to you more about the hippocampus as we go on here. It's my favorite brain region. And he had his hippocampus removed because it was the source of seizures that were killing him. And after his hippocampus was removed, he was still intelligent. He could still have conversations. He could still do normal on IQ, but he couldn't lose, learn anything new. His entire life, his understanding, his memory stopped the moment that they took out his hippocampus. Nothing new got in. It was as if the world was 1953, year after year. It never got forward. And he described his life as like waking up from a dream that he can't remember. So HM, although it's a tragic story, told us something about memory, and it told us something about the hippocampus. It told us that the hippocampus processes new information, and it determines what does or doesn't get into memory. So without the hippocampus, old memories are fine, but new memories don't make it there. So we think of the hippocampus as the gateway to memory. Okay? And the hippocampus is really critical because the hippocampus is where Alzheimer's begins. And if you know someone who's had Alzheimer's or begun to show the symptoms, it's not that they can't remember where they grew up or their childhood. Okay? It's they forget, where did they just park the car? Or what did they do for breakfast? Or why did they walk out the door? It's the recent events that you lose, not the old ones. So this is the hippocampus, my favorite brain region. Okay? It's involved not only in Alzheimer's disease, but in PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so people who have damaged hippocampus are more at risk for trauma. 
for depression, for schizophrenia. So it's really critical to a broad range of mental health issues. Let's talk about aging for a moment. And here are sort of the two key facts to keep in mind. Healthy elderly adults tend to retain old memory as well. You remember your childhood and everything else. The biggest decline is often learning new facts, new skills, new events. In particular, things that depend on the hippocampus. Your gateway is slowly closing, which you should begin to get towards Alzheimer's. And the most important thing you can do is keep that gateway open. So let's talk about Alzheimer's, scariest word we can say today. Okay? What is Alzheimer's disease? So Alzheimer's disease has two things that are characteristic of it. One is plaques outside the neurons, and the other are tangles inside the neurons. And these amyloid plaques, they're deposits of gunk called beta amyloid, and they're there in the soup of the brain, and they tend to kill near neurons nearby, and they're pretty much throughout the brain. So they're the things that are sort of outside the neurons. But if you go inside the neurons, the neurons are the critical cells in the brain, um, you see tangles. They're called neurofibrillary tangles, and they're the dark areas that you see up there. And what they are is like the scaffolding of the brain that have collapsed. It's as if you took all the steel and all the beams in your house, and you turned them into styrofoam, and they began to crumble, and the rest of the house would collapse inwards. And that's what's happening with these tangles. And we see them very early in Alzheimer's, and you see them particularly in the hippocampus, which is why one of the earliest warning signs of hippocampus when seen from brain imaging, pictures taken of the inside of the brain, is the hippocampal region shrinking and getting smaller. So this is a healthy brain. This is what you want your brain to look like. But at the late stages of Alzheimer's, this is what the brain looks like. It's grown shriveled. You can see all the spaces and the gaps. There's obviously a lot less volumes, a lot less mass, many fewer cells. Okay? So what we want to talk about today is how we can keep your brains looking like the one on the left and not on the one on the right. So what's the risk for Alzheimer's, other than tur not turning on your cell phone, turning off your cell phone? So there are some risks that are non-modifiable. They are what they are, OK? Being young, if you're really young, like some of our fabulous young students here, they're not at much risk for Alzheimer's in the next year. Being male, OK, is a, is a risk factor. Males are, are, are greater. These are, I'm sorry, these are protective factors. So being young is protective. Being male is protective. Women are at greater risk. Good genes, choosing your parents well. OK, first, first thing to do okay, to avoid Alzheimer's. And last, to be in good cognitive health, to have no obvious cognitive impairment. Okay? These are the things that are what they are today, and you can't do it. But there are other protective factors, okay, things which will help you avoid memory loss, avoid Alzheimer's. High education, okay, vigorous participation in aerobic physical activities, and we'll get back to that. Being mentally active, doing intellectually challenging things, like coming and trying to follow a lecture by a Rutgers professor or other people. That's keeping your brain active. Diet. Uh, Margaret will talk a little bit more about diet. And thanks to her, you had a wonderful brain and heart healthy breakfast. And I think there may be some more food coming. And low body weight, OK? Obesity is a huge risk factor for memory loss and Alzheimer's, OK? So you want to keep your body weight slim. So all of these factors, some of you may recognize that these are issues in the community. And all of these factors, these modifiable factors, are what are believed to be the major contributors to the elevated risk of Alzheimer's in the African American community. And the good news is they're all modifiable. And our goal is to try to work with you to modify them, to make them less, so that we have as many people as possible keeping their wits about them as long as possible. So here are some scary facts, some notable facts. In the US today, there are 4 million people with Alzheimer's. It affects 1 in 10 people over 65. And half of everyone over 85 is beginning to show some of the signs. It's the fourth leading cause of death. And it currently costs $100 billion annually. Okay. But here's what's happening. On the left shows in 1900, there were less than 5% of the people ever got to over 65. In 2000, it got a little bit over 10%. And you can see what's happening is that our population, there's a, a baby boom is becoming an elder boom. Okay? By 2050, at current rates, almost a quarter of the people are going to be over 65. And what that means is that Alzheimer's disease, by 2050, could quadruple okay? if we don't do something, if we don't minimize it, if we don't avoid it. And that's really the challenge to not only here at Newark, but to the society as a whole. So let me briefly summarize. Um, Alzheimer's disease is a, is a degenerative disease. That means it gets worse and worse. It degenerates that involves plaques and tangles in the brain. 
It's one of many diseases that can cause dementia, which is the loss of higher cognitive function. As the disease progresses, neurons die, especially in the hippocampus, which is key for learning. And African Americans have doubled the risk for Alzheimer's, okay, due primarily to lifestyle and environmental factors. So that's the short story of what you want to know about Alzheimer's. So now comes the question, what can you do? And I want to share with you from our laboratory, from other laboratories, from science, six steps to a better memory. Okay? So the step one is to exercise regularly, and Brandon will tell you more about this later. So here are some quick facts. People who are more physically fit have less cognitive decline, greater brain volume, there's just more of it there. They have reduced risk for Alzheimer's disease. And you can start late in life, even now. There's nobody here who's too old to start exercising. And at this point, you can still improve cognitive function, you can improve brain function, and you can improve the volume. Even for someone who has the beginnings of Alzheimer's, okay, you don't want to send them off jogging in the neighborhood, they might not come back. But if you put them on a treadmill, or you walk with them, okay, physical exercise can help reduce that cognitive decline. I'm going to skip that. The hippocampus, our favorite brain region, six months of, hip of exercise is enough to show some increase. A year of exercise will increase the hippocampus. Big hippocampus is good. People who are physically fit, who have greater aerobic fitness, and you'll hear more about that from Brandon, have bigger hippocampuses. Okay? It, this is the, the best medicine. Okay? So you might ask, well, how does it work? And why is it so powerful? And the answer is, is it so powerful because it works in so many different ways? There's not just one thing that it does. Okay? It reduces stress. Exercise improves sleep. Reduces your risk of stroke. Reduces blood sugar. Increases the ability of neurons, the cells in the brain, to grow and survive. And improves blood supply to the brain. So there's six different ways. And each of them, independently and in parallel, is the ways in which exercise is helping to improve brain function. So the general conclusion is exercise has widespread effects on the brain. Even moderate intensity exercise a few days a week will improve mental health. Even starting exercise late in life, you can't say, oh, I, it's too late. You can do it today. And it should have long-term benefits for it helping brain health. So the lifestyle recommendation number one is get regular aerobic exercise. And aerobic means you're breathing heavy. Your heart is pumping. Okay? You have to feel your heart pumping. And you know you're helping not only your heart, but your brain. Now, there's a caveat here, okay, which is people say, I'm really into sports. I'm a real sports person. Okay? This is not aerobic exercise. Okay? Sports observation is not sports participation. Tip number two, keep mentally active. Everything that applies to keeping the body physically active applies to keeping the brain physically active. Okay? Cut the risk for Alzheimer's in half if you keep mentally engaged. It does much of the same thing, increases brain volume, reduces shrinkage in the hippocampus. What it does is it creates a cognitive reserve. The more you know, the more you learn, the more brain connections you have, the more resilient you are to some of those things being damaged with age and Alzheimer's. It's literally as you learn new things, synapses, connections in the brain grow, neurons grow. You can actually grow new parts of your brain by learning something new, and we're going to come to that in a little bit. Okay? So lifestyle recommendation number two is stay mentally active. Whether it's Sudoku or chess, you want to use your brain or lose it. And there's some very st scary statistics that each additional hour of TV watched per week increase your risk of Alzheimer's by 30%. Now you might think, well, mother was right. It really is the boob tube. It really does rot your brain. Now it's probably not the case that the, that the rays are, are rotting your brain. What it is is that every hour that you're spending there, sort of slack-jawed, ah, watching TV, OK, is an hour you're not engaging your brain, an hour you're not out there physically active. So excessive TV watching is a marker for lack of physical and mental engagement. So lifestyle recommendation number two is you want to learn something new. And I want to talk a bit about learning, because learning is really how we get the brain active. Just doing something you know over and over again, re re repeating something you know doesn't really engage the brain, doesn't really grow new neurons. New neurons grow when you learn something new. And so there are several steps to learning. You want to observe somebody else doing something. You want to practice something piece by piece. And then you want to practice with hints. And then you want to rehearse at home. So I'm going to, uh, OK, this is not working here. So do we have, where's the AV? Is this, sorry, is 
It's not working? Sorry, this is not working. Oh, here it goes. Okay, you all set to learn something new? We're going to learn this new. Uh, by the way, if the AV is here, can we turn up the volume on the music? It's a little bit low, right? A little hard to hear in the back? Yes. Yeah, so if our AV people are here, Diane, can we get them to turn up the volume? But before we try to sing, I need some help. I'm not much of a singer, but there are some fabulous singers here. And uh, you all know who you are. I've come around. And uh, so I want to ask my friends from New Hope and some of the other friends to come on up. C come on. We got, we got some of the choir singers. Some singers. Francis Dixon, I know if you come up, I know if you come up, you're going to bring them in Ingrid. Come on up. Come on. We want to get some of our choir singers. Where's this AV guy? He disappeared. OK. Francis. Come on up. All right. Thank you so much. Where's the AV guy? OK. I want, no. You can get on the stage, too. We got, we got, you, you well, we have to, we have to do it here. You got, you guys can come up here, stage too. Come on back, come on back here. So, from any choir at all, from any choir at all, and uh, we're going to learn, we're going to learn, we're going to grow new brain, we're going to grow new brain cells here. Come on around. Now, maybe a little hard to see the lyrics here. That's going to be a little bit of a problem. So, okay. Okay. So, oh, so you guys all come on in close. Okay. okay. Thanks for so, we're going to all say it together. Come in close. Let, let's, we're going to do it first by just speaking it aloud. Thanks for the memories. We're just going to say it first, then we'll go through it. Thanks for the memories. Thanks of, for the memories. Of rainy afternoons. Of rainy afternoons. Swinging Harlem tunes. Swinging Harlem tunes. Of motor trips and burning lips and burning toast and prunes. Oh, and burning lips and burning lips. Burning lips. How lovely it was. How lovely it was. Okay, let's just stick with that one first verse. Okay, you ready? So now, let's see this here. Ready? We'll sing. Now we're all going to sing along. Thanks for the memories of rainy afternoons, swinging Harlem tunes, of motor trips and burning lips and burning toast and tunes. How lovely it was. Thanks for the memories of candlelight and wine, castles on the Rhine, of Parthenon and moments on the Wilson River line. How lovely it was. Thank you. You've all learned something new. <laughs> You've all. Thank you all. That was short. Short and sweet. Thank you. So for those of you who've just learned those two verses, you have grown new neural connections. OK? New neural connections are what you want to do. And whether it's learning a new song or learning a new dance, that's going to keep your brain alive. So let me talk about number three. Tip number three is avoid unproductive stress. OK? Any Star Trek fans here? Yeah? OK. So I want you to imagine that it's back in the 60s, and Captain Kirk is the captain of the Starship Enterprise. And he has to decide how to respond to a Klingon attack. OK? So Kirk does three things. He sends three orders down. He says, release all unnecessary cargo. Okay, dump it into space because we need to be light and nimble. 
Kirk says, shut down all unessential systems, cooking, repair, lights. None of these things are necessary for the fight against the Klingons. And finally, he tells down to Scotty in the engine room, Scotty, give me warp factor seven. Okay, you want to gun the engines as fast as you can to escape. So this is how you escape from the Klingons. Now, what does this have to do with stress? Well, Scotty warns Captain Kirk. He says, but Captain, he says, the dilithium crystals, they cannot take the strain. And Kirk says, well, damn the dilithium crystals. We have to escape from the Klingons. So what Kirk is doing is he's making a decision here. He's saying, yes, going up to warp speed is going to cause some damage. But if the Klingons blow us to pieces, it doesn't matter what happens to the, to the engine. So it's, you take, you, you take a, a trade-off. You're willing to damage some of these, uh, these parts of your system in order to escape and survive for another day. And that's the trade-off that happens with stress. So your body's stress response is similar. It wasn't designed necessarily for Klingons, but it was designed for this. Okay, saber-toothed tigers. Now it's been a long time since they've been seen on Raymond Boulevard. Okay, but your body is still primed and your brain is still primed as if there were saber-toothed tigers on Raymond Boulevard. So when you get stressed, your body is, does exactly what it should do if you came across a saber-toothed tiger on Raymond Boulevard. You void all unnecessary cargo, okay? Two, you shut down all non-essential systems, immune, menstrual cycles, sleep, all these things aren't essential to escaping from the tiger. And lastly, you ramp up the brain to warp speed. Okay? Your brain becomes incredibly fast and incredibly focused because you have to get away from the uh, tiger. And all these things are good. You get faster brain and body responses. You get focused attention. The whole world focuses. Your whole brain focuses on this tiger. And you get increased alertness. You're incredible, your hearing, your vision. Okay? All of that is fabulous to allow you to survive the next five minutes. But there's a cost. And just like on the Starship Enterprise, the cost is damaging the dilithium crystals in Scotty's engine. The cost is that stress hormones set the body and brain to warp drive, but they're toxic to the hippocampus, our key brain region for memory. Stress releases a hormone called cortisol, which is the hormone that stops new neurons from growing. So all that fun we had, all those new neurons, that uh, we grew when we were singing that old Bob Hope song, that's all been undone by stress. Stress is going to stop that from happening. Stress decreases the hippocampus. And women especially are particularly vulnerable to the effects of stress on the brain because of interactions with estrogen and other reproductive hormones. So lifestyle recommendation three is be aware of how you react to stress. Avoid counterproductive stress reactions. Okay, if it's not a saber-toothed tiger, if it's not an 18-wheeler coming down the road at you, it's probably not a stress situation, a situation where stress is good. Exercise and sleep, which we talk about, are both really important. If you don't get enough exercise, you don't get enough sleep, your body can't deal with the stress, can't distinguish between productive and unproductive stress. So when unproductive stress begins, when you're stuck in traffic on the Garden State Parkway, okay, or when you call your broker and he tells you what your retirement fund is doing, okay? Now, that's the time when you might start to get stressed, but that stress isn't going to help you. So you want to think about it as that stress reaction is building. Think about Scotty down in the engine room saying, but Kirk, the hippocampal neurons, they cannot take the strain, okay? Be good to your hippocampal neurons and they'll be good to you. Get a good night's sleep. We've mentioned this a few times. Well, let me tell you why it's so important. Okay, let's talk about sleep again from the point of view of an example, from a metaphor. We have a number of people here who like to go shopping, right? You go out shopping, you have a busy day of shopping, you come back, you look like this shopaholic with all the bags in hand, and there are a couple of things that you need to do. You need to review and organize what you did for today's shopping. What did you buy, okay? You need to discard the excess, the paper, the wrapping, the bags, okay? And then you need to take all these fabulous things that you bought, and you need to put the shoes in the shoe box, and you need to put the dresses hanging in the closet, okay? And when you're done with all that, okay, you've reviewed it, you've discarded the excess, you've put away your things, you're ready to go out shopping again, okay? So sleep is very much like what happens when you come back from a day of shopping. Sleep is where the brain reviews and organizes what's happened during the day. 
It's where the stuff that isn't important, the unessential things, get discarded. And it's part of a dialogue. There's a conversation that goes on between the hippocampus, which is that little structure down there, the little yellow structure in the middle, and the rest of the brain, which is where things are stored. And there's a dialogue back and forth where the things that the hippocampus has brought into the gateway are sent out and put where they should be. And if you don't sleep, then all the new things that you learned, all those fabulous lyrics to the Bob Hope song, if you don't sleep, they're gone tomorrow. You need to sleep. You need to what's called consolidate that memory with sleep so it becomes permanent. So storing the memories to cortex, to the long-term memory stores, is critical. So let me summarize. Sleep is essential for stabilizing, organizing, optimizing, and keeping permanent your memories. They, it, it enables a dialogue between the hippocampus, the gateway, and the long-term memory storage. Sleep disruption is common in aging and disease, and it's one of the reasons why you often see memory impairments. And even a short nap, an afternoon nap, it can be helpful for beginning to consolidate some of those memories, for freeing up the hippocampus to learn new things. So recommendation number four is sleep more both at night and if you can, take naps during the day. So five, socialize with others. Everybody here gets an A plus from Rutgers for socializing because you're all here with your friends and your community co partners. So living alone doubles the risk for dementia and Alzheimer's. Living alone later in life can triple the risk. Animal studies confirm that, the, that mice that are exposed to other mice have less of these plaques in their brain. And why? Why are other people good for us? Well, it's as long as they don't cause us stress. Okay, that could be the other way around. But, so you want to be with people who don't cause you stress um, and who promote good lifestyles. But it's the social and intellectual stimulation. It's coming out. It's interacting with people. It's talking with them. It's, it's having a conversation. Um, all of that helps keep your mind alive. So I'm very lucky. I have some fabulous friends here in the community. Um, these are just a few of them. You may recognize yourselves. So all of you, both up here in the photo and the rest of you out here, you're part of what keeps my brain healthy and young. Thank you. Friends? We met at nine. We met at eight. I was on time. No, you were late. Yes, I remember it well. We dined with friends. We dined alone. A ten of sand. Oh, yes. I remember it when that dazzling April moon. There was none that night, and the month was June. That's right. That's right. It warms my heart to know that you remember still the way you do. Oh, yes. So your friends can serve many roles. Partly they can help fill in the gaps, the things you don't remember, and they can reassure you that you're still young at heart. So the last bit of advice, one which will sort of set up the stage for uh, later on we have lunch, is to eat light and healthy. Your diet is a critical part of brain health, and Margaret Camarari will tell you a bit more about that later. So you want to manage body weight. Obesity is one of the, the, the big risk factors for brain, brain damage, for Alzheimer's. You want to avoid saturated fats and high cholesterol foods. You want to eat brain protective foods, dark fruits, vegetables, cold water fish like salmon and tuna, and lots of nuts. So these are the kind of the diet. Some of it's often called a Mediterranean diet, which can help you keep your brain healthy. So that's a little bit of a brain healthy diet. So now you're at Rutgers, you've come back to school, and one of the things that you remember from school, perhaps associated with a little bit of stress, were final exams. So we're going to have a little bit of a final exam here before I wrap up. So I'm going to go through and see, I'm going to give you a hint, and you see how many of these six you remember. Okay, can you remember all six in order? Okay, so one is exercise, two is Keep mentally active. Three, avoid unproductive stress. If there's a saber-toothed tiger or something's about to kill you, it's okay to be stressed. Get a good night's sleep. And the last one, almost last. And finally, eat light and healthy. Okay. 
So now people say, I can't possibly remember all six. I have a memory disorder. OK? Too many things to remember to help my memory. So people say, is there one thing I can do? One thing you can do instead. OK, so this comes to the homework assignment. The other thing you remember that was stressful in, in, in college and high school was homework. So here's your homework assignment. What you want to do is you want to go home and do the following. OK, this is the official Rutgers Newark method for memory enhancement and Alzheimer's prevention. You want to have frequent vigorous sex with an intelligent partner. OK. And you can, you can tell them that Dr. Gluck told you you had to. <laughs> because frequent vigorous sex with an intelligent partner is exercise. It reduces stress. It's mentally active if you talk to them before or after. Uh, you're socializing with somebody else. And then afterwards, you can roll over and sleep better. So it pretty much covers everything. The only thing it doesn't cover is eating light and healthy. Uh, but we're going to come to that later. So that brings me to the end of how Rutgers Newark is going to help you improve your brain health. And for those of you who'd like to find out a little bit more about the brain research and the brain health programs, um, I invite you to come visit our website at www.memory.rutgers.edu. So that's it. Thank you all very much. Okay, Diane, where's Diane? Should we take a little break for a minute?